Oh, absolutely. Yeah, when we got off the truck, when we got off the, the plane in Dubrovnik, I we got a taxi to our hotel and the guy was like, um, he's like, what are you doing? You, you're driving from, you, you, you're riding your bike? I, to where? I go, oh, we're going to ride all the way up to Trieste. And he's, no, 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 catamaran, catamaran better. This is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. I was like, oh God, here we go. So, and, but it's because of these, these massive freeways in Croatia that um, some, you can avoid them most of the time. You can go down on the, on the, like the bike tracks or, or the villages by the ocean or industrial areas. You can, and like some of them go through like Roman ruins and it's just incredible. But sometimes you can't avoid the freeway. And that's when it gets, you know, you're on a bike with a, I'm carrying a, like a 25 kilogram trolley and uh, a, a truck goes past. And that's when, yeah, you sort of like, uh, really think about all the things you've done in your life. And <laughs> think about, think about if you've uh, accomplished some things and hold on for the ride. <sighs> Bloody terrifying. Hey, and welcome to Global Horizons. I'm your host, Rob Maliki. Thanks for your company today. And I'm somewhere a little bit different from usual. I'm on Ghana country in Adelaide. Outside, it's a cracking afternoon. Sun is shining, as only Adelaide knows how to do. It's about 40 degrees. And I've walked down the street to the offices of the Insider Guides. And my guest today is James Martin, the Managing Director of Insider Guides. James, thanks for joining me, mate. Hey, thanks for having me. It's great. Now, mate, let's paint a picture. It's the month of May, but it's still chilly in Boston in the USA, and it's a rooftop bar, lots of people mingling, mingling around, chatting over a beer, and you come up to me and another fella, and you say day. <laughs> what happens next? I remember this. This was a massive US conference. What is it called again? NAFSA. That NAFSA, yeah. Jeez, it was like 15,000 people. Very, very intimidating. And it was like an Australia-focused dinner. No, I think that was at a time when I, I had this idea to sort of create some 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 sort of version of Lonely Planet type concept in the US. And I was like, oh, I'm going to go to the US. I'm going to try this out. But at the same time, like I had been going to the AIECs in Adelaide and, and all over Australia. And I, know, I was just realizing that my strategies weren't really working where I was I was trying to like talk to people but my networking wasn't quite right and I just wasn't making enough inroads or quick enough so I just remember coming up to you and asking you hey look you're you're, you're a service provider like me trying to like hustle from the sidelines you seem to have these great connections how did you do that because I, I honestly, because I don't work for a university, I'm doing my own business. How did you sort of make yourself feel comfortable in such an uncomfortable environment? And I remember what you said to me was something around the lines of, look, just keep going. It's not as scary as you think or something like that. And I was like, that's good. That's good advice. Yeah, I did. I just kept going. <laughs> <laughs> Which is good, mate. It's good for the whole industry and testament to perseverance because it is hard as a service provider. So for those people who are listening who maybe work in an institution, a university or otherwise, what's it like working as a provider outside of a big organisation but providing services into it? I love it. I mean, it's not for everyone. I mean, you don't get the, I guess, cushiness or the comfort of a massive organization to support you and give you all these sort of layers of training and professional development and HR. So, I mean, you do everything in a small business, which is, you know, the life of a small business owner is unlike anything, as you know. But in the international education sector, I find it to be quite good if you are trustworthy, you're likable, and you have a sense of authority about what you're doing. If, you, if you're good at what you do, people tend to resonate towards that. And we've been lucky enough to do enough good work over a long enough period of time. And I hope I'm a likable guy. <laughs> and I've got enough of a, of a way with people that, yeah, we've sort of just... And we've also just stuck around for ages. So people don't look at us as some sort of fly-by-night guy that's just coming in to do something quick and make a buck and leave. Like, I've been doing this for about 16 years now. So <laughs> I've just been, this is my career. So yeah, I mean, I love it. I, I think it's a great sector to be in. It's relatively small when you break it down into the kinds of people that I need to have as clients. And I don't you don't need a huge amount of clients to have a business. The, the sector is big enough for businesses like ours. And it's just a matter of doing the good work again and again, showing up every day, being consistent. And yeah, it's great. One of the things that I always loved when, or, or as we've run our businesses working in international ed and being external to universities is you kind of get this wonderful mix of being able to work in with some of the best elements of institutions. So working with international students, hearing their stories, helping to provide into that experience, but then also having that freedom and flexibility to be able to move fast because you're 
small and nimble and able to respond to conditions that, that come up. Do you find that too? Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And it's also really nice to be able to, you know, fly across the country and, and meet with different universities and get a bit of a holistic view as to what's going on just through these conversations. I don't think universities do that enough. I don't think they sort of go interstate and meet with other universities and colleagues all the time. So the, as a service provider, I can go and meet with different study bodies and, de- and destination clusters and then go and meet with different universities, colleges, TAFEs, private providers, and sort of, you know, within a month, you get a very good idea of like where the sector is at and I yeah I really like that and then you combine and you layer it on with what students are saying directly into the business and how are they feeding the insider guides content you sort of create that cycle of you know you have a good, trying to get some understanding of what the sector is doing trying to understand what the students needs are and you try to balance them together and then you've got then you've got the business so doing that kind of work traveling around visiting lots of different institutions organizations public private etc what do you observe in 2024 what's your sort of pulse check on the industry you know it's funny i at the aiec last year i got a bit of a sense of like almost like a nervous energy in the sector where people were starting to sort of i just got this feeling like they were up for experimentation again like they knew that you know there was a million different announcements by the government and i think the writing was on the wall that they were going to start sort of like trying to restrict international students somewhat but and i just got this feeling like all right well then we need to tell a better story or we need to cut through better and it can't just be about like you know, agent commissions and and recruitment trips anymore. You really got to start thinking about creating a dynamic and engaging place on your website and through your content. So yeah, there's a lot of experimentation. Things that I'm noticing, I think the level of testimonial content for students is improving a lot. I think universities are starting to realize that like while you know, user generated content is is great, there are there is a really good spot for a high quality testimonial maybe two minute video that you can get of an international student talking about what they actually really love about that place that city that campus and then you use that as the hero video then you can cut out you know 30 second grabs 15 second grabs and then syndicate it on things like instagram tiktok those sorts of things and just being smart with you know clipping the ticket you know making sure that you you know you don't just do a shoot And then it sits on YouTube and gets, you know, eight views. You are leveraging content and you're leveraging the power of your channels in all kinds of ways and paying attention to to the results of that and doubling down. Yeah, and and context is so important, isn't it? You just mentioned a couple of important things there around channels, but making sure that the the content, the story is contextually relevant to the platform that it's going to go up on. It's not just good enough yeah. just to copy and paste the same video exactly. into the same place. No, that's right. And and just things like, you know, when you're doing YouTube, ensuring that you've thought about the title of the YouTube video before you actually create the video. You know, things like that where just thinking about the way people search. I mean, it's the second biggest search engine in the world and it's used as a bit of a dumping ground for a lot of institutions um, to, to put up videos that, you know, they don't use them as well as they possibly could. And so, yeah, just thinking about, all right, I'm going to get this piece of content used. I'm going to interview this student. It's going to be a video. It's going to be a written article. We're going to chop the written article into different grabs and we're going to chop the, the video piece into like seven different grabs and that's going to go out in 10 different ways that's how content marketing is going to have to work this year honestly i think it's a resourcing issue i don't think that institutions can really afford to get a whole bunch of videos done and they can't afford for them to sit in a dropbox somewhere for like nine months while you know central marketing works out what they're going to do with them or something it's it's got to be quick it's got to be dynamic and it's you got you have to do it all the time you know students need to know why they should stick around or they will move on to a different place <laughs> yeah it's a crazy time isn't it so mm. i mean talk just just for context on on my interest in content you know six seven years ago i stumbled across or just put a yeah, crappy video up on youtube of, of walking around a uni campus and that video got thousands of views because there was just very little independent content on youtube so i created just a channel called choosing your uni and you know that's that's done relatively well just as a little sort of side fun project off the side of my desk i've definitely noticed that the nature of content is changing mm. like production quality is becoming more important than ever before i guess maybe that's just to do with the fact that there is so much more out there mm. so to stand up and shine now it's not good enough just to create the video but it's actually got to be 
really good. Yeah. And it is really overwhelming as well. Like, you know, there are, con- there are marketing managers who are unsure like where they should invest. Is it, should it be YouTube or TikTok or Instagram or Meta or whatever, whatever and or their emails or their website. Like for us, for example, our, I'll be honest, our YouTube channel is horrendous. We don't invest in it really. We've just chosen to not spend a lot of effort on that. And it's, we put more of our effort into creating very good content for our website. And I'd say sort of a lot of websites, you know, 10, 20% of their traffic is generated through paid. And, but I think about 97% of our traffic is coming through organic means or direct means. So people are just finding it through just big answering questions. And that's where we, we've got to get comfortable with the fact that we're like a supermarket. People come in, they get what they want and they leave. You know, that's the sort of how we operate. <laughs> It's funny, isn't it? I feel like the whole world of content on the internet is going through this huge shift right now because, you know, AI, generative AI means that any mug with an access to the internet can now write articles authoritatively about any subject in the universe. But the problem with that is that there's nobody to quality control that. And so what I feel is happening right now is like this massive decline in trust from users of the internet in the information that they see there which if you flip that over the inverse of that is that there's actually this rising value in reputation so your 90 percent percent organic traffic is almost like the most valuable freaking thing because people go oh inside i got like i trust that now yeah. and you become you know it's not being done by generative ai real humans writing real content and so that just becomes like exponentially more valuable over time. Yeah, well, we're fortunate. I mean, that, you know, that, that I think every media company in 2024 is trying to grapple with how to use AI. And, you know, I've seen a lot of media companies out there restructuring their staffing around that so they don't need to hire, you know, some copywriters anymore. They can do a lot internally. Blah, blah. Look, my fear around it is, first of all, I agree with you around trust. Trust is the ultimate currency. But if you're not sort of interviewing i guess international students and and getting those there's really authentic stories and you're just relying on ai generated content to fill your pages then not only are you missing an opportunity to really connect deeper with your audience uh, and prospective students by showing you know one-on-one insights into why this place is amazing but you're also just getting close to your competition because they're all doing this like they're all they're all creating ai generated content so it is a race to the bottom i mean if everyone is just producing ai generated content again and again where does that leave an organization that invests in high quality you know student driven student rich content they'll go to the top they'll be the ones that that can that can shine over a longer period of time so you know i've had to sort of talk to my staff about it a fair bit you know everyone is terrified of ai it's it's and you know we want we want to be able to say look ai is not interviewing students ai is not you know creating the kind of content that we want to create that we want to do good work in so you know in a way we're somewhat we're not immune absolutely but we are i'm trying to sort of create moats around our value proposition and i guess that's sort of yeah how we're thinking about it can we talk about storytelling Sure. Yeah. Because I reckon, I mean, once again, sort of coming to this thing where, you know, a machine can now crank out text, mm. but like a text is not a story. And to some extent, like a student testimonial on its own is not a story. Mm. You know, I'm, I'm sure you've seen tons and tons of just absolute vanilla. <laughs> <laughs> You're laughing because it's true, right? Like just vanilla student testimonial, which actually doesn't inspire, it doesn't educate, it doesn't persuade. But storytelling is the difference. Do, do you think that's... True. Yeah, I think international uh, students, when they've got a good story to tell, they are fantastic. But actually creating content with international students in them is is not that easy. There's a few ways that we've been able to sort of navigate it over the years. One of the ways is, is understanding the goal of the content. First of all, is it actually to tell Joe Blog's story or is it to get across the fact that this faculty is amazing or this course is amazing? They're two different goals. And if the goal is the latter it might be more effective to get a few students, you know, talking about the same thing and cutting it up in that way than just getting this one student to tell them. Like, the, okay, so <laughs> what happens normally is an, an institution will get a get a student in, they won't pay them, which means there's a 50% chance they won't rock up, which is a huge mistake a lot of institutions make because they just don't, any anything just they just students just want to be compensated for the time they'll set up this whole camera equipment they'll get like a really good crew in and then they'll just be like so joe blogs tell me about your experience here at x university or college and the student will just like 
off the cuff tell them blah, 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 blah. Then they'll go into the edits and they'll realize that the student has not actually given them like what they need. Like <laughs> the student's gone now, he's gone. And they've just worked out that he's, not only have they not got the script, like they haven't hit the marketing points. They've not mentioned their unique selling propositions. And now the student's gone and it's just, it's not working. So over the years, we've sort of come up with a bit of a methodology where we will do two things. We will work with the brands in advance to sort of work out what their key messages are. Then we'll create a full script for the student. Then we'll get the student to stick to that script for one take. And then we'll do another take where it's just off the cuff, authentic stuff. And then we'll blend it together and provide a much more sort of authentic outcome. But it does actually hit the points that the the marketing manager wanted to begin with. Yeah. So that's sort of just an area that we, I feel a lot of institutions, they don't, they don't know where to start. And so they end up getting the same sort of content they've always got. Kind of the feeling that I get too, when I like look a lot of the content out there produced by universities is, I mean, swap out university X and put in university Y and it's basically the same, same piece of content. Whereas to me, you know, yeah, international students coming to Australia, face so many challenges but we don't talk about those challenges very often the challenge is the interesting bit it's the bit where like somebody overcomes adversity there's a moment of change and therein lies the story that makes people go huh that was cool and actually want to consume that whereas i think a lot of that kind of traditional content tends to shy away from that moment of change and that's when it becomes vanilla well, it, I think, yeah, and it also becomes vanilla when the institution thinks this person's story is so interesting that people will find it on their own. And that's just not how it, the internet works. Like, the, like, you know, this person could talk about their fantastic experience as an engineer and it could be a really interesting two-minute video and then they'll put it up on YouTube and they'll, they'll just assume that it's going to get great, great traction, but it gets crickets and they wonder why. And you're like, well, what problem is it solving for anyone it's how you use that content as well because that that content would have been better inserted into a website on a really high traffic page it wouldn't it shouldn't be sitting on a standalone youtube page no one's no one's going to discover it yeah there's a there's a body of work there around for, for lots of institutions to sort of start thinking about all right so i've got this content i'm going to do something better than just put it up online and, and hope for the best i'm going to use this in like 10 different ways really tactic tactically Let's start with, with video and then maybe we'll, we'll talk about text afterwards because yeah, I'm interested sure. in the two. But like, what are three things that people could do with video content, whether it's like a really polished production for an institution or whether it's somebody at their desk who needs to create a piece of content for, for their work, three top tips that you would have for them to actually improve the output that they create. So the first thing I think I would do, and surprisingly this is not done enough, is to think about the goal of the content up front. Like why should this exist? And in the same vein, where is it gonna go? Because where is it gonna go is hugely important and it changes how it's filmed. Is it gonna be in a vertical format, a wider format, things like that. And yeah, what's gonna to happen to it when it's finished? So many times, it, you know, you, you would have seen it. It goes up on YouTube and it gets crickets, as I said before, but you gotta think about those two things. Secondly is be okay knowing that you can actually produce quite good content on quite a small budget, but it won't be like unbelievable professional video quality, but it will get you the, the meat. It'll get you the, the really good stuff. And it's okay to be a bit agile. I mean, it, it doesn't, just because you're a big university with millions and millions of dollars in, in but it doesn't mean that everything has to look you know, absolutely schmick. It's more important that this content is coming out on a regular basis and you're showing up every day and you're being agile and it's always on than it is to take eight months to produce something and then you know rely on that piece of content as the thing you did this year. It's got to come out more often than that. Second of all, I would say be the third. I think just being careful with how you set up for those shoots. You know, like think think about rigging, thinking about lo locations. You want to be agile. You want to be quick. You don't want big shoot days that last for you know five days. If you really only needed one or two, you can save a huge budget by just thinking like for, for example putting locations close together so they don't have to sort of unpack and, and set up 10 times over five days you can just do it all in like two that's a huge thing i don't think people realize just how expensive it is you're, you're paying if you don't do that you're paying for crews to like pack down move across town 
pack up, set up, things like that. That just chews up so much budget and I'm not sure if a lot of brands understand that. And then, yeah, rigging as well is is you don't need like catering trucks and things like you don't need all those sorts of things. You just, you need one or two cameras, two or three people. Yes, it won't be, you know, as polished as the university's main video, but you got it done in three days and you can do it again next month because you thought about content in a different way. Right, yeah. you're solving a problem for someone. That's where people come back for it, won't they? Mm. I mean, case in point, if you're listening to this on the podcast, then you won't see it. But if you're watching it on the fly, you'll see James and I have just set up in there in the spare office at the inside of the Cider Guides office. Like this yeah. is normally the studio, but they're in between in between jobs. So a yes. bit of stuff. Yes, yeah, is the the stick. <laughs> But this is what it's about, right? Like mm. it's about just saying, okay, well, what's the purpose of us getting together to have a chat? Really, this is about trying to find out what's working with content in 2024, picking picking your brain because this is your specialty. So, so yeah, like people will get value from what you're trying to create rather than um, looking at it, every pixel being perfect. So shoot with an iPhone and a good microphone and that can be enough depending on what you're trying to do. Yeah, it all comes down to the goal. It comes down to the goal and, and, and your budget, but you can do a lot with very little. Now, the other thing that, so, so interestingly, like I, I read, read one of your posts where you're talking about that moving nimbly and shooting quickly because of the amount of time that you can save. So I read that on, on LinkedIn. So maybe that's a good segue to, to written content. What are, you, what are you observing in terms of written content and what tips would you have for people in terms of improving their written content? Well, it really comes down to the, to the, the way in which you plan to use it. I mean, if, if you're looking at, would you be talking about, I guess, like course-related content or, ma- or just marketing-related? Yeah, like mar- Marcoms, let's, let's talk mm. let's stick to the Marcoms stuff. Yeah. But like everything is Marcoms, basically, outside of your course content. You're sending an email to your boss yep. asking for a response on something. Mm. That's Marcoms. I mean, you need, mm-hmm. you, know, you need to get the attention of your boss and get a, a response. So... Mm. To me, having a really thoughtful subject line, yeah, maybe with a bit of curiosity or some emotion in it, yeah, is way more likely to get clicked and opened and responded to, yeah, than than otherwise. Absolutely, yeah. Look, I think it's just simple language, like just just less is more. I think with good quality content, following the Aida principles was attention, interest, desire, action. So attention, really the goal of good copywriting is for someone to read the first line and that is enough for to get them to read the second line. And the goal of the second line is to get them to read the third line. So when you're sort of writing good copy, it's a ma- it's you sort of stick to some basic principles. Understanding the, air, the place that you plan on producing that content also matters. Like for example, LinkedIn punishes people who write in big, chunks of text and you know if they get you get punished if you tag more than five people in a, in, in a post they think you're trying to span the platform so just thinking about where it's going what, it, what it's doing in terms of speaking to international students i think cultural understanding is is absolutely massive for example like you don't use aussie slang words in your in your marketing copy if that copy is going out in you know in another country they would have, have no idea what you're talking about. Or even contextual information that you you think is very obvious. Like, walk down High the Street and you'll see this and that. And you're like, oh, like people don't even know what you're talking about. They don't even know what city you're talking about. You, you know, you just got to stop and think about who your audience is when you write this content. Yeah, simplifying. Yeah, copywriting is such a huge area. It's it's an interesting one. I think also just watching out for red flags. Obviously, just, you know, there's so many things that can trip people up when they're doing copy that just being very aware <laughs> and pulling that back a bit it's true isn't it i find and this is coming you know back to that stuff around generative ai which it just doesn't handle at all it misses context and specificity so i love that one about you know simplifying your language and sentence structure when i write on linkedin i tend to just like one sentence and then leave a space sentence and leave a space yep. because i was reading some copywriting um techniques and it just makes it super easy to super easy to read. Mm. I mean, you can literally scan through it and hit keywords, and you can read it twice as fast. Yeah. And so when people are scrolling, scrolling a feed, that's kind of what you want. Yeah, that's what I mean, that that's the way it was designed, wasn't it? And then that's what LinkedIn knows that when people are searching, like scrolling the feed, they they they're not spending a lot of time on each post. And if you, yours is just chunky text, they're going to skip it. So why why should they promote that? Yeah, I've, I've been really enjoying your posts recently on LinkedIn. Yeah, it were really worth following if you're listening to this podcast. James Martin, Insider Guys, just look him up and, and, and hit follow on LinkedIn because like super actionable and interesting in stats. What's, what's driving your interest to sort of write more on LinkedIn these days? As a small business owner, I'm always trying to look for areas that I can scale my time. 
and that's one area that I tend to I tend to spend a lot of spend a lot of time on LinkedIn, talk, talking to people, working out what's going in the, in the sector. And I just thought, look, if if I'm going to be doing that, I should, you know, I want to do less consuming and more creating this year. And that's just one of my own goals is to, you know, sometimes I feel I've been doing this a long time. And and for a long time, I didn't really want to be in the spotlight. I never put any things together to speak at conferences. And I don't really put myself out there in big speaking gigs or thought leadership, long posts and things like that. Not since I started the business, actually. Thanks, Triple J, for that little one. But I just haven't really done it. But this year, I thought, look, I'm getting a lot of value out of this. And there's a lot going on in the sector. And also Rob Lawrence helped me a bit during during COVID when um, you guys did podcast a few podcasts, right? Uh, yeah, web webinars. webinars uh, yeah, yeah, they yeah. Were good. yeah. Yeah, just when I just when no one was really no one really knew what to do, we were we were very quick to, to sort of start producing those webinars just when it first happened. And you know, we were getting, you know, five hundred webinar participants every one and just and it was I had just realize the power of scale and talking it like that so and then obviously the business changed uh, up until that point we were doing uh, just channel marketing people would buy ads through our channel and things like that but that sort of came to a screeching halt during covid when you know no one was buying ads when no one knew if students could <laughs> could even get into the country so we were we just had to be really careful and nimble and we started offering our services you know we realized we were quite good at storytelling and content creation and we started we opened a studio and we started offering that as a service and now that makes up about half of half of our business now is, is studio work. So yeah, it's a bit of a different time. But uh, yeah, I, I think this year I just wouldn't mind uh, getting out there. And, and, and I've learned a lot over the past 15 years. And, and I always want to keep learning from the sector. There's so many interesting people. And like what you're doing here is, you know, with podcasting and, and it's, it's all, we're just, we've just created a framework for experimentation. And, and, you know, this is all, this is what it's about. This is what life is about, like trying new things seeing what sticks, you know, have some fun along the way, learn some things. It's all, you know, I love it. That's so true. And, you know, maybe some people listening to this don't like to write on LinkedIn. It took me a little while to get into the idea of it. But then I just thought, look, I've got something to share, you know, like some value to add. And, and maybe that's just a good rule for copywriting in general is when you're, when you're creating copy, whether it's an email to a boss or, you know, a piece of marketing content is like, where is the value? Like, where is the value for the person that's going to invest their hard-earned and precious seconds and minutes? You know, what are they going to get out of this? And I think if you approach any piece of content with that in mind, just always just like meticulously focused, religiously focused on finding that value. Mm. First, that you're more comfortable with it. Don't you feel that? Like yeah. you're writing for LinkedIn? Yeah, yeah. It's, like, a li- it's a little bit more forgiving as a platform. People yeah. aren't trying to destroy your entire career. <laughs> post something on Facebook or Instagram like oh why don't you do it I think LinkedIn's a bit more forgiving and people are kind of nice and also it's a very effective generator of business I'll be honest like you know we I talk a lot to a lot of people on there and and if you build a little bit of a profile and you build authority there it translates you know that's it helps it helps small business owners like us so yeah let's shift a little this is obviously a fun space international education international education education but also the sort of travel stuff you travel much yeah absolutely tell me more (laughs) where's where's your favorite place man i don't know i i really loved vietnam as i first my first time i went overseas i went to um, go overseas in vietnam but travel for me has over the years changed in many ways i lived in indonesia for a few months and then just like the last two or three years, my wife and I have been getting into bike touring. So we <laughs> packed our ba- bikes into a box and took it over to C- Croatia and rode across the country and trained for it and everything. It started in Dubrovnik and ended in Trieste up in Italy, which was amazing. And then last year we did Norway as well, where, where, where she's from. But yeah, that's a whole new way of travel, which I love. Why is it so good? Well... I absolutely love how it completely removes all the things that you hate about travel. So, which is things like uh, things like hotel queues and taxis and buses and tour groups and all the stuff that just makes a bit of travel a bit of a grind. It's so nice to just, you know, you get up in the morning, you have a bit of breakfast, you put some sunscreen on and whew, you're off and you're just like cruising through mountains and you're smelling everything and it's so you're getting fitter like you, it's only a holiday you come home fitter well not the only holiday but it's one of the holidays that you come home fitter than when you and you left but you get off the bikes about two o'clock you're tired you're feeling amazing because your endorphins are flowing you can eat and drink whatever you want because you're burning like two three thousand calories a day and i just thought it was like i just think it's amazing so yeah that's sort of we're kind of addicted now <laughs> It's a good addiction to have. Yeah. So where's on the list then? Where would you go? If, if, if I could give you a, a magic plane ticket 
for you, your wife, and your bikes. Mm. Flying out of Adelaide to go anywhere in the world, no stops, <laughs> direct direct ticket. Where would you go? Man, oh man, it's a tough one. I think about this all the time. Um, I honestly, I'm always trying to look for. It's funny you ask that because I'm in the middle of trying to work out where the next one is, and I've I've crossed. Like I had Patagonia on the list and I was like, nah, the roads are too bad quality. You can't do that. It's too windy. <laughs> Gone. Then I had places in Asia and I was like, uh, well, where I need bike tracks. Like I, I can't be riding on the road in, in this way. This is going to be too dangerous. So I'm like, I mean, I'm not, we're not one of those crazy cyclists that will be like, I'm going to ride from, you know, Sydney to Dem- yeah, yeah. Dempasar to London or something. <laughs> not not interested in that we just yeah we do like a little bit of camping a little bit of airbnb so actually europe is the best absolutely incredible when it's like dark and miserable in australia and like deep into july or august you chuck your bikes in a box and you fly into like you know south of france and like cruise for three weeks it is like one of life's joys it's so good so yeah amazing have you had any interesting encounters on those, any or actually, because you know, the thing that I think a lot of people think of cycle touring is, oh, risky, you know, fatiguing, risky drivers, motorists. Have you had any near misses? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, when we got off the truck, when we got off the the plane in Dubrovnik, I we got a taxi to our hotel, and the guy was like, "What are you doing? You, you're driving from, you you you're riding your bike, to where? And I go, oh, we're gonna ride all the way up to Trieste. He goes, no, 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 catamaran, catamaran better. This is wrong. What you're doing is wrong. I was like, oh God, here we go. So, and, but it's because of these, these massive freeways in Croatia that some, you can avoid them most of the time. You can go down on the, on the, like the bike tracks or, or the villages by the ocean or industrial areas. You can, and like some of them go through like Roman ruins and it's just incredible. But sometimes you can't avoid the freeway. And that's when it gets, you know, you're on a bike with a, I'm carrying a, like a 25 kilogram trolley and uh, a, a truck goes past. And that's when, yeah, you sort of like think about all the things you've done in your life. And <laughs> think about, think about if you've accomplished some things and hold on for the ride. <sighs> Bloody terrifying. What else? So, I mean, cycle touring is a, is a recent addiction. What about before that? Where's been the most unusual place that you've been? Unusual? Jeez. We went, my wife works in the waste area and we went to Nicaragua and we went to a waste dump there, which was, shoot, like there was a charity being run there and that was really unusual. There were kids riding on bareback horses through this waste dump and like picking things out and, you know, they would like try to salvage things out, out of this waste dump and then sell them and try and live off there. They were living in, in Squalo. It was terrible. And so we were there just sort of helping a little charity out and, and helping out. But so that was pretty unusual. I'll tell you a place, if you are anyone who is interested in traveling, I would think Japan is like the best. I always say it's like, if you're after a, a version of travel, which is so strange to what you're used to, but you still want the comfort of of a nice place, Japan is is got to be the perfect nexus point. It is so unusual, yet you feel completely safe and happy to be around there. It's like, yeah, I always find Japan to just be such a strange, amazing place for that reason. Tell me more. I haven't been to Japan. Oh. Never really had an interest to go there, to be honest, until mm. maybe in the last couple of years. I'm like, oh, maybe. Yeah. So persuade me. Why? Where? How? Well, I mean, the cultural differences are, are pretty extreme. Like you just you're just walking around the cities of Tokyo, and, and you just you're like, this is this is out of another planet. Like you, you know, you come up one subway station, you feel like you're in a video game, and the next one you walk up, and you're you know you're in a beautiful park with beautiful flowers, and it's just good. And then and then they just they're just into things that that you wouldn't think that anyone really really interested in. Like there's there's a whole bunch of cafes. I mean, everyone knows about these cat cafes. We just sit into a, which is, you know, don't bother with them. They're terrible. But there are, there are other ones which are really kind of odd, like otter cafes or owl cafes. And yeah, but we, I don't know, we're, we're sort of more nature focused. So we got out of there and we went to, we did the Nakasendo Way, which is an old Shogun trail in between Kyoto and Tokyo. And we just walked that for about four days or three days or something and staying in traditional ryokans and things like that, which is just, I, I think that's the best thing about Japan is getting out of the cities and going into those bamboo forests and, and walking along the Shogun routes very like uncommon although i did walk into a little like coffee shop and i was like Bling, I walk in there and you think oh no one's ever been here before and I look on the wall and there's a picture of joanna lumley she's been there like three weeks before i was like damn it joanna absolutely fabulous unbelievable got there before me <laughs> can't beat it and now it's in the lonely planet it's on it the it's in the guidebooks and everybody's gonna Bloody stop joanna. there 
Unbelievable. Yeah. That was, yeah, so that I think Japan's pretty crazy. So what else is coming up for you guys this year? Tell me about some of the interesting stuff that you guys are working on. Where I guess from our perspective, we are working with a huge range of clients on um, talking to international students in, in very interesting ways. So we're working with the OSHC sector quite a lot to really help them understand, like just sort of talk to international students a lot more. We're flying around the country doing a range of shoots. I'm really focused on, I guess, social license as well around, I, I feel like the Australian community doesn't really understand international education all that well. And there is just so many low hanging fruit ways for, for the sector that I feel is a little bit under, under profiled in many ways. I feel like there's so many ways we could be, you know, yelling from the rooftops in, in, in more ways. Like what? What should we be doing? Well, you know... If, if James mm, Martin had a mm. $100 million budget, it's not a huge amount given what the sector gives, but if the government said, we want to solve this problem, James, here's $100 million to go fix it, what would you do? Well, first of all, I would create incentives for the sector at large to start talking to the Australian community about why, the, why the Australia as a whole is better because of international education. I don't think people care enough or really understand it at all. You know, something like they bring in like 67% of tourism spend is related to international education, but it makes up only two to 3% of the marketing budget of Austrade. And I just couldn't believe that. I remember learning about the British Council back in the day. And I remember them uh, when I was in London, they were saying they had like offices all over the world and you could go into them. And, and there's like a part of that the office, which is all about studying and studying in the UK. And I was like, this is incredible. Like. And I checked, does Austrade have that? They're like, no, nah, Austrade doesn't have those sorts of offices that they don't exist. And I'm like, why not? We're meant to be a powerhouse of international education. I just think I would I would incentivize institutions and government to not just focus on students and agents and start promoting to the sec to the general Australian population and start making connections better. Like for example, during COVID, there was a huge number of nursing students and hospitality students that propped up parts of the Australian economy which would have fallen to bits had they not done that and i don't think the sector has really you know shone a light on that th those sorts of stories in the moment i think australia knew like oh well it's great these students are here because we can sort of use them in that way but now when i feel like australia is on the precipice of a bit of a pervasive narrative where students are sort of considered a part of the problem it's it's sad to see that going on you know housing issues and infrastructure and things like that now's the time for the sector to step up and say hold on a second you know we were we helped so much in so many ways and like for example airbnb they got a similar situation where they get criticized heavily for taking long-term housing stock off the market and giving it to the sh and using it as short term. So therefore they're a contributor to the housing crisis. You know what they did as soon as that happened? They, they created a huge campaign. They've, if you check LinkedIn and you look at the ads, they driving people to a landing page with an animation on it explaining actually Airbnb contributed millions of dollars to the Australian community. You know, if it wasn't for us, this would have you know, this would have been a lot worse. Here is the economic impact and the social impact of Airbnb. Look how amazing we have made Australia as a result of this. Look how much we've added to the tourism bottom line. Stop telling, stop thinking Airbnb is the problem. We're actually contributing a huge amount. And I'm like, that that same strategy needs to happen in international education. It's, it's a no-brainer. We've got to get out there and start yelling a bit more. I think that's true. And do, do you think that, uh, joining some dots on this conversation, some efforts have been made. You know, IEAA spent some of the membership-owned money to try and do some of that. So there have been some efforts made. But do you think some of that needs to be done more contextually in community so taking that international student who's in Toowoomba or outside Toowoomba you know one of the further out places who's working in the you know aged care facility there and telling their story to the local community that helps that community understand the impact that those humans have in the space in which they operate that that may actually be more effective than big national campaign yeah I mean a national campaign's fine but it e campaigns end you know this this is this is happening now and there's no campaign running right now from what i know of so there needs to be systemized inbuilt always on approaches to telling the community that the international students are part of it and part of that is you know the institutions can create better pathways for inst for international students to better connect with industry to better connect with like create incentives around things like volunteering and and those sorts of things where the general population can see it can see, really see them involved and i think that's where tourism does a 
does a better job or maybe it's not them doing a better job but that's the difference like people people notice tourists and the uh, and the campaigns are always in the media as like oh you know where the bloody hell are you all this kind of stuff it's, it's i think when was the last time you saw a, a campaign that related to international education get any wide attraction i mean we're still promoting australia like, sometimes i feel like we don't back ourselves enough you know we got to think bigger be bigger and and it's i don't think it's going to be as hard as everyone thinks yeah last yeah. question sure tiktok to tiktok or to not tiktok <laughs> so i'm not on tiktok no. yeah yeah <laughs> but it still seems like it i mean it, well established platform now super saturated what do you reckon i mean we're at the start of that journey as well i don't proclaim to be an expert in tiktok but i am seeing unbelievable reach on tiktok i may as well not do any other platform it is just so unbelievably powerful in terms of like you know they haven't turned, they haven't restricted the algorithm yet so when you put out a post it just gets seen by all of your followers at once rather than facebook where they start restricting your posts and your followers and, and then and then you have to pay facebook money for them to for you to see be seen by your own fans tiktok hasn't done that and neither is linkedin from what i understand so yeah i mean it's fantastic yes I've, i know there's a lot of concerns around the ownership structures and things like that but yeah we're starting to play around with it we're starting to see huge traction the biggest thing for small business owners for like me though are try and you are trying to work out what does success look like and that is hard because you could spend millions of dollars on Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, LinkedIn, YouTube, and, you know, is it doing what you want it to do? And that's our challenge as a channel is trying to work out, you know, a, this is a channel where the where the where where we don't really have a loyal audience. Or we're not trying to grow a lo lo really loyal audience. People come in, they use us and they go. What's the value in investing in huge, massive channels like that if we're not sort of keeping them for, you know, four, four, three to four years? So for other businesses, it's, it's a huge opportunity. For us, content online on the website is our focus. And I think, look, if TikTok satisfies your goal of generating eyeballs and you can measure how it pushes traffic back to your site and it's doing a job, double down because... We, I had my, my cousin works over at the Guardian and she was saying it's it's unbelievable and how how much traction the Guardian gets from TikTok it's it's ridiculous so yeah it's huge well James super good chatting with you on the podcast and I'd love to do this again sometime you know mate, might might be like a once once a year kind of thing for us to just catch up and talk about the current trends in content because I don't know anyone in the industry that would be seeing as much and creating as much of it as you are so I really appreciate you you, you know generously sharing your insights oh, thanks um, man yeah I'd on the podcast it. today and very very stoked man that you know a decade plus on from that beer on a rooftop <laughs> somewhere in Boston that not only you're still kicking, but you're thriving too, mate. So congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Yeah. And look, I mean, for all the young professionals out there, you know, it's okay to, to feel a bit lost at those conferences and try to join those young professionals groups and, and, and be a part of it. Don't stop moving in that direction. There's so many ways for you to get involved. So yeah, that's my advice. <laughs> Thanks for joining me on Global Horizons. Thanks, mate. The Global Horizons podcast is brought to you by The Global Society, Australia's learning abroad support company. For about 10 years, The Global Society has been supporting Australian learning abroad teams with technology, training, consulting, strategy, marketing, you name it. We all know that learning abroad is time consuming and complex. So if your team could use a little bit of extra support, reach out to The Global Society, globalsociety.com. Today's episode was recorded on Garigal land in Sydney and we pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Thank you. See you next time.